and we're going to go to part two of my interview with former Bengals assistant offensive line and running back coach Kyle Kasky. That was going to be uh, my next question in trade. You know, everybody talks about in the first round, the 28th pick. You know, what if one of the four quarterbacks slides to 28 and teams start calling? Uh, could the Bengals move back? It'd be a great draft. It, there, there's basically, in my mind, there's not – from the 10th pick, probably the – there's not even maybe a, necessarily a top 10 that you can say, okay, these guys, here it is, the top 10. So pick 10 – and pick in the middle of the third round, there's not a huge drop-off in talent. I mean, there's a good middle class, and it's a long middle class in this year's draft. So getting that extra fourth and fifth round pick or even an extra third if you can work it out uh, makes a lot of sense. How difficult is it to make those trades, though? In your experiences, how often are teams calling and communicating and, and probing to see if trades can be made as opposed to what kind of percentage you're actually consummated? Uh, you'd be surprised at how many people call. So there's a set of phones in the back. And uh, when I was there, there was one in front of Duke. There was one in front of Marvin. There was one in front of Katie and Troy. Uh, and uh, there was another one in front of uh, like Steven Radicevich or something. There was one of those guys had one, but there, they, we had like five numbers you could call. Uh, and we sent that out to all the, the team. So if for some reason somebody was on one, you had another one to call. And uh, it, it's, I'd say in the first round, depending on where we were, like when we were, when we had some of those mid 20, like those early 20 ones, I'd say some people started calling. Um, and, and that's when it would be brought up to the group. And a lot of times Mr. Brown would you just veto it and say, no, I don't want to do that. Or if it was something crazy and they said, they want to give us, you know, their, their first, we're, we're going to flop first rounders and they're going to give us their second rounder. Then it's like, Oh, we better listen to this. Uh -huh. And that's where later in the draft, it starts to, you know, you get those calls like with the mixing thing and this was second round, but uh, Minnesota called us and traded up with us uh, and gave us, I believe a, a fourth or a fifth round pick to drop eight spots. And we knew, we knew they were taking Dalvin cook and we were still wanting Joe. Right. And so it was one of those things where we took the chance of saying, okay, what are those picks between Minnesota and us? If we drop eight and swap spots with them, are any of those guys going to take any of the guys we want? And that's where you're you're playing. I mean, you're 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 playing the percentages on what the other teams need, and that's where we decided to do that. I know we traded up at one point, and I believe uh, it was either Zeitler or Billy Price, and maybe been both of them uh, early on. And uh, we took you know took some of those guys, and you know those are decisions that when those calls are made. I, as a position coach, if it's not my position, I sit there and be as quiet as possible. And I just take it in because yeah. it's not a, not my place to, to speak on that, but it, it's, it's pretty cool to watch the process. Cause if it's a, if it's a, if it's worth it and you, you do it, I'd say that your percentage wise, man, I'd say 5% actually get pulled. The, when I was with the Bengals, let's say 5% of them got actually triggered to do it. Right. Right. Okay, so mock drafts. I mean, everybody and everybody and his brother. The mock drafting of, of NFL uh, drafts have have become a cottage industry. I mean, yeah. Mel Kiper Jr. started it, but there's a million of them now. Everybody has their own mock draft. The teams, the actual organizations, do mock drafts as well. You know, at, mm. in their preparation process. When you're doing mock drafts, um, it. it how many how many different ways can these mock drafts go based on okay well I, I know the schematic that they're running offensively you know they're wide receiver centric and not tight end like the Bengals are wide receiver centric more so than tight end uh, this defensive football team has this type of schematic and they're uh, these these positions have yeah. more value to them than maybe other football teams when you're going through that mock is all of that I mean is it, it it's I'm not saying it's like another science, but it's pretty sophisticated, isn't it? Yeah, and and the way we did it in Cincy, which was kind of a fun deal, was the every coach and scout and owner, uh, you know, Mr. Brown picked for the Bengals, obviously, uh, but we all got a team or two sometimes, depending on how many people were in there. And usually we picked our teams based on if we knew that team well. So if we had a coach that just came from another team, uh, they would take that team. Uh, if we, if I was friends with somebody and, and I knew somebody really well at another team, I would try to choose that team. Cause I can, I kind of have a feel cause I talk to these people and they're friends of mine. I know, but 
like if I were to come back to the to the Bengals right now and they said, "What team do you want?" I'd probably take the Lions or the Jaguars because right. I just know their rosters and, uh, and I, you know, I'm not that far removed from those teams. And uh, but it, you know, it's one of those things where we would pick, and uh, if we knew we were getting close to the Bengals pick. I know there were some coaches on staff that would uh, kind of play around and take the guy that we knew we really wanted and, uh, you know, to just fluster the room. And uh, Mr. Brown didn't, wasn't having it sometimes. He's like, they're not taking that guy. And we, we put him back on the board. But Or he'd be like, okay, well, they took our guy. All right, let's figure this out. And it, it's funny, though, because we, we, we hit pretty well on – out of my, my nine seasons of sitting in the draft room, I'd say – I'd say five and nine. We were pretty dead on the first and second rounds. Now we were, it was pretty close. And uh, I'm talking about the majority of the picks that there were a couple where some, some, somebody got picked that wasn't supposed to be picked in the real draft. And it kind of screwed up everybody's mock draft. Right. Um, kind of like this whole Aaron Rodgers thing that just happened to screwing everybody's mock draft up, I'm sure. So, right. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, trades mess things up. And, but I'd say, I'd say it was, we were pretty on it. And, and the, the, the science behind it is this. There is no science. It is all about creating conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it's creating situations that maybe we hadn't thought of. Um, you know, it's it's having somebody getting taken somewhere that uh, you know you didn't think was going to they were going to get taken, or maybe there were like I said before, there's somebody that was higher on our list that's just still there. Do we want that guy? Do we do we want that guy over this? Guy? Do we want Tyler Eifert over an offensive lineman or whatever the case is? And it just creates conversation. So how big a plus is it that there's continuity and consistency in the coaching staff? You know, Zach's had the same coordinators and, and predominantly position coaches for a good part of his tenure. You know, I mean, all the, both, all the coordinators and including assistant head coach and special teams coordinator, Darren Simmons, offensive and defense coordinator, they've all been together and a good part of the assistant coaches uh, have as well as I mentioned scouts. It, there's continuity there. How big a plus is that, do you think? Uh, it's a huge plus. And you, know, you hit something I meant, I guess I should have hit on earlier when I was talking about the, the later part of the draft. Uh, Darren Simmons has been there since 2003. And Darren Simmons, I'd say, probably has had a hand in, in more fifth, sixth, seventh round picks than anybody because mm -hmm. at that point you are looking at somebody that is probably going to be a backup, but can they do something for our team? And that's where you get backup linebackers, tight ends, running backs, safeties. Those kind of guys get picked there because uh, guys like Darren have put in the time to say, yeah, this guy's a core four guy for us. He can go cover kicks. He can, you know, he, he can get back and block. And uh, But other than that, I'd say the continuity really is important uh, because, number one, uh, you, you're, you're getting the same viewpoint year in, year out of where are we trying to get to? Because I know we changed coordinators – uh, quite a few. Well, I'd say between the time Hugh left, then we had Zamp, Zampezi, and then we had uh, Bill Lazor. And you do that over about a three-year period, and you're starting to get a, a different feel for what what are we on offense. And uh, same thing on defense. You know, if you change guys too often, you start thinking, you know, what are, what are we on defense? But in all reality, I mean, the the continuity is good because it, it you're working with the same people, you've got the same flow with them but you got to make sure you keep it uh, on edge too, because I think sometimes if you, if you're around people for so long, you start getting too comfortable. And um, I think they've done a good job because I, I watched, I watched Luana Rumo's defense and from what he started as uh, in 2019, I believe uh, is when they came in, they he's, it's a, I mean, they're, they're a different dynamic now and they're growing. Right. And offensively, I mean, obviously, you got the best quarterback in the league, in my opinion. Uh, and all you do is you build around him and, and I, that's, they've done a great job of that. So I, I think just having the same viewpoint and doing that uh, has helped them out a ton. Finally for you. And I appreciate you giving us the time you yeah. gave us and the knowledge and the information. You've been great. The wild, wild West of college free agency <laughs> after the, the draft is over. I mean, you guys are banging the phones in the seventh round or maybe even earlier with guys. Hey, look, you know, um, we'd love to love to have you here if, in fact, you don't get drafted. And 
sometimes I, I can imagine sometimes that's tough calls. You know, you have with, with guys that are, they're disappointed. They didn't get drafted. Take me through that wild, wild West of uh, the recruiting. Like you said, almost college recruiting of, of college free agency after the draft. Yeah. I think number one, you kind of hit it on the head just then is that that's a call they don't want to hear. Yeah. And there's certain guys you can make that call to and certain agents you can make that call to, and they understand. And you can probably make that call before the draft with some of the guys. If, if you just go, Hey, listen, if you don't get picked, uh, you know, we'd like to have you here. Right. You know, I, I hope you get picked. I just don't see us picking you in this certain position or whatever in this draft. And there's certain drafts that I knew I, we were getting one running back and it was probably gonna be an early guy like Joe uh, Mixon. And then it's like, I know I'm not picking another one probably. And then, you know, I, that's why I tell people we're picking one in the first or second round and I'll talk to you afterwards. But I think the biggest thing is when you get on the phone with these guys and, and it depends on who their agent is. A lot of times, you know, if you get agents that, you know, cause after over time you start to get to know these agents, sure. and they, they become, you know, people that you trust or you don't trust. And same with you, same with like me to them, they, they trust me or they don't trust me. And I mean, sometimes it's not my fault that they don't trust me. We just, I would make a, I'd say, Hey, we're trying to sign your guy. And then all of a sudden we sign somebody else today. Hey, I'm sorry, man. And then they get mad, but right. a lot, sometimes though, there's these signing bonuses and there's a, there's a number and I don't even know what the number is this year. It used to be around 75,000 and you could break that up between all of your college free agent signees for signing bonuses. You could give it all to one guy or you could give, you know, 5,000 out to whatever. And these agents start asking, well, the Cowboys are giving us 15,000 and you're only giving us five. Okay. Well, the Cowboys also have a stable of running backs that aren't going anywhere. I'm just using this as an example. We, we have a shot that this kid makes the, the team. He's going to make the rookie minimum of 450 or 500 or whatever it is nice. now. And do you want, do you want that extra 10,000 or do you want that extra, you know, 500,000 when it's all said and done? Yeah. And that's where I tried to explain to the players is listen, you have a legit shot at making this team. Like I'll, I'll use a guy, uh, uh, Quentin flowers that we got from South Florida one year, he was a quarterback in, in South Florida, but we signed him as a running back. And he, he had talents that I knew I, I knew could translate to running back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kept trying to tell him. You're, you're probably not, you you have a better shot at making our practice squad or our team as a running back than you do as a quarterback. And I just had to be, have that honest conversation with him at the time. And not that he wasn't a good quarterback, but he was a better runner. He was a, I mean, you put him at running back on South Florida's team and he was the best running back on the team. And he, there was two guys that got drafted off that team. So point being is you, you have to have those conversations with those guys and explain to them. And, and a lot of times when you land a guy like a uh, James Wilder jr. That we had for a couple of years, uh, Terrell Watson, uh, you know, you get guys like that, Trey Carson. Um, those are really, really good running backs that we got to come in because they trusted us that, listen, you come in and work, you'll make the team at some point. And they all did. Dave Lapham here. And every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football as a player. I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Opportunity knocking.